Hey, Amen. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to KJV Cafe. My name is Pastor Clark Covington, and today we're talking about a subject that might be my one of my favorite subjects, and that's food. <laughs> hey, who loves food? If you know me, you know I love food. My in-laws, I was eating, they cooked some good food. Uh, they're from uh, Laos, Thailand area, and they cooked some unique dishes. I love it. And my mother-in-law, I don't even think it was a compliment. She said, uh, oh, Clark, you, uh, you, you, you make eating look so great or something like that. It's so delicious when you eat, when the way that you eat, I'm like, I'm just enjoying the food. Amen. I love food. My daughter told me today that she loves food. You know, what's better than a good meal with friends and family? You know, uh, I, I, I can't think of anything. You know, you go to a cookout, you know, and you've got friends there. I mean, some of my fondest memories are at cookouts. I remember even me and in high school and uh, my friends would have a cookout and they they let me come over, amen, I enjoy uh, food with them. Or I remember getting a little bit older and there'd be a low country boil somebody would put on and uh, man, you'd have the corn and the potatoes and crab and all this and Hey, that's amazing. You know, just, I love the smell. I love the taste. Um, I love learning about food. Uh, my wife loves to cook. Uh, I guess I, I'm not a great cook, but I enjoy it sometimes here and there. Uh, all kinds of food, you know, going to Monte all and Cherville. I, you know, we go there sometimes after soul winning. Some good Christian folks own that place. Uh, Cherville, North Carolina. If you're ever in the area, Monte all is the bomb, the bomb.com right there, Montiel. It's a little Mexican restaurant in a strip center. And, uh, they're just good folks. Amen. They're just nice folks. Good Christian folks. Um, very rare too, that they don't serve alcohol. You know, think about how many Mexican restaurants you've been in that do not serve alcohol. That's it. And they, and clearly could make a bunch of money if they did and they chose not to. So I just love them. I love their food. And I remember we went there, you know, after soul winning, uh, you know, with the, with the cruises and our good friends, amen. And, uh, we would sit there and eat and laugh and it's just, I love it. Uh, I remember we had some missionaries from the Philippines and they were kind of nervous. They were going to stay at our house and they had been in Ohio and they had traveled all the way from Ohio here to North Carolina. And, uh, we had met the, the brother of the missionary, you know, the brother in Christ, uh, brother Freddie, but we had not met his wife. We had not met his, uh, daughter. And, uh, you know, we met them in the driveway and, you know, helped them carry their stuff in. And as soon as they came in, my wife had a pot on the stove of uh, some kind of rice soup. And I don't know exactly what it is, but it was familiar enough that they were just so excited because it reminded them of home in the Philippines. And matter of fact, when you look at a map and you look at Laos and Thailand and the Philippines, they are near each other. Amen. They're both, they're all warm, I've heard. <laughs> but um, man, they just, they, it made them feel at home. So, you know, I, I'm not going to go any deeper. I'm sure I could. Uh, probably people listening are like, is this a podcast about food or about God? It's about God. It's about his word. I'm going to get to that. I, I could go much deeper into loving food, enjoying food. I believe God gave us food as a, as a great pleasure uh, to enjoy in this life. Amen. And when you live in the country, by the way, I mean, I've lived in the city and stuff. And when you live in the country, like that's like that, that's like what you do, by the way. You just go either cook something or you go out to eat. That's like the big event. You know, I know in like cities you have like the center of the arts and museums and all these other things. Like in the country, man, you, you know, it's, it's a big day if you get some food uh, somewhere. So could go on and on, but I think you get the idea that food is wonderful, but there's something that we should value more than food, that we should esteem more than food. And our text verse here, Job 23, 12, absolutely love this verse. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job is saying that he has not backslid on the commandments of God, that he's lived for God, and that he esteems God's word even more than the food that he would need that's necessary for him to survive and to live and to thrive. And, uh, you know, that's a that's something that was happening then, still happening now. 
You know, sometimes my wife will get hangry. And if you know about that, that's hungry and angry. Um, I guess I can get that way too. But she's especially keen on just like not eating and then drinking a lot of coffee and being all jacked up. And I'm like, this lady needs to eat. She'll just be turn on you on a dime like a roaring lion. But, uh, uh, you know, we all need food to nourish our bodies, to give us energy, to help us not be hangry, if you would. Uh, and even in the Bible times, you know, it'll there'll be stories there in the in the New Testament, and Old Testament about eating to strengthen our bodies. That we need to strengthen our bodies as we eat, and so food is necessary. And Job has he has esteemed God's word more than his necessary food. And think about the context of this verse. We're at Job chapter twenty three. If you're familiar with Job, it is a longer book. It's uh, traditionally known as the oldest book written in the Bible. Um, it's about there midway through the Bible in the Old Testament. And Job is a longer book. It's 40 some chapters. And if you're familiar with the the, the, the uh, book of Job, it moves quite quickly from Job uh, being found perfect in God's sight, okay, to Job losing everything. His, he was he was uh, very rich and he had a lot, amen, and he lost it all. Uh, Job won. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Okay, so he's perfect and upright before God. He loves God. He eschewed evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters, so he's got ten kids. And his substance was very great, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, on and on. And back then, the livestock, that would really be something uh, to write home about. That would be like having a lot of money or gold because your livestock would help you live and survive. It also would produce for you to help you gain great wealth, right? Uh, those sheep would have uh, fur that you could shear, amen? And the camels could help you transport goods, right? The oxen could tread the ground and so forth and tread the corn, uh, you know, on and on. And he had a very great household. And so we see here, verse 1 tells us who, uh, in Job 1, who Job is. Verse 7, uh, here we got Satan coming up to God. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro, uh, fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And so we see in the first eight verses, you're setting up um, Job's wealth and his substance. You're setting up Satan going before God. This is typically the passage that is cited in Job chapter one that is cited when people ask, does Satan have access to God? And does Satan talk to God? Here we see that Satan certainly was talking to God and that he had to basically get permission from God to take all of this good stuff, all the kids, uh, the health and the wealth of Job away from him. Right. And it also shows here that God uh, found Job to be a servant, perfect and upright. That's a big compliment coming from a holy God. Amen. And, uh, you know, so Job saying, well, you know, he's he's perfect and upright. The, Satan saying this about Job, that he's perfect and upright because you've protected him, you know, and you've got a hedge around him and he's very wealthy, you know, and he's just doing great. And uh, God said, okay, bet, let's do this. You go ahead and take all that he has and we'll see how he does. And we'll see if he doesn't still praise me. Uh, and we see here a few verses later in 13, 14, 15, and 16 that Job loses all his substance. All his children are killed. All his livestock is gone. Everything is gone. Buildings are gone. Uh uh, only a few servants survive, and then shortly thereafter, his health goes from him, and he's got boils from head to toe. This all happens very quickly in terms of the kind of map of the book of Job. This would be the introduction. This would be chapter one. This would be when all these things happen to Job. And here we have uh, in chapter 23, so a good bit later in the book of Job, Job saying, I haven't backslid. Uh, I've obeyed his commandments and I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And so in the midst of things spiraling out of control, Job is testifying that he, that he loves God and that he's following God despite his affliction. Job helps us understand the importance of God's word. And this idea is living out the idea of God 
uh, first in our lives. You'll hear people say, God first. There was a popular campaign uh, some years ago, what would Jesus do, right? This is what you should think about first. Well, the idea of putting God first, of making him Lord, is more than just something that we'll put on a t-shirt or a wristband. It's things like when everything is spiraling out of control, you say, I'm esteeming God's word more than my necessary food. By the way, I just thought of this. Some people stress eat, right? You know, and they're, they're stressed about everything and they're just going to eat something. There's like a commercial I saw once where some lady was stressed and she got into like a pint of ice cream and ate the whole thing, right? And it's like, oh, ha, ha, you know, stress eating, right? Well, you know what? Job wasn't stress eating. He was taking his petition before God. To be a healthy and vibrant, productive Christian, we must value God's word this much. We must value his word more than our necessary food. And I think I did a good job in the introduction explaining how much I enjoy food. And, and yet I also have thought a lot about this. Uh, I do my Bible study pretty much first thing. You know, I get up and I might, you know, uh, uh, wash my face or something or make tea, some green tea if the water's hot enough uh, on boil or whatever it is. But I pretty much go right to the word. And I try to go to the word before I eat anything because it is a picture of God's word being more important to me than my necessary food, right? Despite affliction, Job had not backslid. He did not turn his back on God, even, remember this, at his wife's urging. What did his wife say? She said, curse God, you know, curse God and die, didn't she? That was his wife. And I've heard a lot of preaching on this. About, you know, like, oh, why would the wife say that? And then, um, you know, uh, one message I heard, I believe it was at a previous church years ago that I had gone to, uh, was like, oh, well, the wife had 10 kids and she had to bear all those kids. And can you imagine, you know, things like that. And that's true. You know, she's been through a lot. But you know what? We're not going to excuse the comment. OK, she said curse God and die because of what had happened. And if you want to get very particular, you could think of the wife's treasure was maybe in the children or maybe in the wealth, you know, uh, but maybe wasn't completely in God. Uh, and he, so he's sick and he's struggling in Job 2 and you got Job 2, nine, uh, Job 2, 8, and he took him a pot shard to scrape himself with all and he sat down among the ashes. He's sitting in ashes. He's got boils head to toe. He's lost his children. He's lost his wealth. Verse 9, then said his wife unto him, does that st- does, dost thou still retain thine integrity? That's the question. Curse God and die. That's what his wife said. But he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. And of course, we have that quote from Job. There's so much value and wisdom in Job, by the way. That quote from Job about the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But he said, look, how can you, how can you say curse God and, and die? I'm going to, re- yes, I'm going to re- keep my integrity. Because you know what? We got good from God. We could receive evil from God. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. He didn't sin with his lips. By the way, one of the easiest and most frequent ways that we all can fall into sin is with our lips. And the more time I've spent in the ministry and the more time I've spent studying God's word, the more that I pray for the Lord to guard my mouth. I'll literally pray things like, Lord, guard my tongue, guard my mouth, guard my words, help me, Lord, because I'm like you. I'm like anyone else. I could say something stupid or inappropriate. You know, I don't know. And his wife certainly did say something not good about God, but God allowed it. He remained, uh, kept his integrity. He through affliction, even at his wife's urging, would not forsake God, okay? And so he is saying, Job is saying, that he has esteemed God's word more than his necessary food. And I want to give you a picture of this that's actually in the book of Job. Job 1, 4 through 5 shows us that Job lived out these words. He wasn't speaking this and then living a different way. Okay, he was talking the talk and Job was walking the walk. Job 1, 4 through 5. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So every day they're having a feast in their houses. This is prior to them dying, by the way. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them. And look at this. This is Job uh, chapter 1, verse 5, if you have your Bible. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, 
It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. And so we see here that Job is acting in belief of God and in fear of God and is getting up early. You have to remember the time here was Old Testament times. Again, the book of Job is is known or said to be the oldest book in the Bible. And so at that time, it wouldn't have been rising up and reading the Bible per se, because maybe they didn't have that, right? What would they have at that time? Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know what they'd have at that time. Maybe a scroll of some kind, maybe some kind of history that came from Adam. We don't know. But what they certainly had at that time was a sacrificial system where Job would rise up and sacrifice for each child. And the sacrifice is a big deal in the Bible. And the, and God would give um, uh, uh, instructions on how to sacrifice. That's the idea of the firstling of the flock or the first fruit. You are taping the, taking the ripest fruit or the spryest animal, and you are, instead of y- eating it, selling it, you are giving it to God. Amen. You are burning that thing up for God. And it's a big deal. And it was very important. And God stopped short of anyone sacrificing their kids because uh, other false gods, pagan idols, the devil required that they require like Molech, the god of fire, required that they that people would sacrifice their firstborn or one of their kids, literally throwing their child in the fire. And that's an abomination to God. God created the children. God loved the children just like He loved the children then. Because you could say, "Oh, that's horrible. How could anyone do that?" Well, abortion is still. Uh, alive and well in this country, despite Roe versus Wade being overturned, there are many states that are that are that are proud to abort babies. There are organizations that want to promote aborting babies. I've seen them, and so uh, the sacrifice of children is still alive and well, sadly, in this country. But Job was he was offering sacrifices for his children because he believed in God and he feared God. And we understand the book of Proverbs tells us, as well as in the book of Job, that the beginning of wisdom is to fear God. We are to fear him. That means we are to believe in him enough to know that he is God and that he is all powerful. Amen. And so Job was walking the walk and talking the talk, or talking the talk and walking the walk, whatever you want to say. Job was doing it. He was living it. You know, he had credibility in my eyes because he was doing things like that. Why do you think that's in the book of Job? Because number one, it shows to me, maybe the kids were, maybe they were a little reckless, right? Because Job was concerned. And so what did he do? He got up early. I love my kids to pieces. I pray for them, all three of them, all the time. I pray for them all the time. I don't get up at the crack of dawn and offer sacrifices for them because they have might have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. I worry about them. Uh, cursing God in their hearts. I worry about them turning from God. It seems like such a trend, especially among uh, young adults, that they turn their back on God. I talked to a brother in Christ that had grown up in the bus ministry and was much older now. He said he was the last one attending a church uh, of all those bus kids. He said he'd reach out to some of them, but they'd all kind of gone their own way. And uh, he said there were a lot of kids. If I think I remember correctly, he says 50 kids. I think he said that 50 kids, Lord knows. And he's the only one left of that bus route that's still going to church. That should tell you something, by the way. And that's not that's not a rare story. That's not like the exception. That's pretty much the common narrative, is that many young folks have just forsaken God, and Job was worried about it, and Job was doing something about it. And this shows us that he has esteemed the words of God more than his necessary food. If I had to guess, when he got up early in the morning, he wasn't sitting down there and having his... Uh, oatmeal or his bacon and eggs, I bet you he was going out there first thing and and he was doing this because he esteemed the word of God that high. I just think it's incredible that connection in the book of Job. And you want a New Testament reference? Let's look at the book of James. James 1, 22 through 25. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So in James 1, 22 tells us, we're deceiving our own selves if we're not doing what God calls us to do. And in 25, it tells us we'll be blessed if we do do what God calls us to do. We see Job live out his faith in his actions. 
And you can think about the context. I mean, th- th- there's so much richness and depth in the Bible. And as I put together this message, these, these things just kept coming to me. I believe by the work of the Holy Spirit. Think about the context of Job doing this. You know, that's something for your average poor man to go do, right? Like your average person to go out and, and pray for their kids. Uh, how about someone that is rich beyond measure? You know, think about, about what that means. Like how many people, how many servants were under him? How many people were telling him how smart he was and how prosperous he was and how much God must have just blessed him? Remember in the Old Testament times, oftentimes God's hand came through material blessings, right? Uh, what was Canaan? It was a materially rich place, the land of milk and honey. Amen. Uh, even today, looking at Jerusalem, looking at Israel, it's incredible. You're in the mid- Middle East and you have all of this richness of um, agriculture there. We see Job despite his richness, because I've heard it said that 99 out of 100 can handle poverty, but uh, 99 out of 100 could not handle prosperity. And I hope I didn't butcher that too bad. But basically, everybody can handle being broke, but hardly anybody can handle being rich. I have to believe that's true, that we don't know what we're doing with prosperity. Number one, there are many people out there that have made money their God, and then that God's going to let them down because it's a false God, and it's a dead God, and it's a pagan idol. And once they receive all that money, they're going to say, I'm still not happy, I'm still not complete, I'm still not satisfied, and they about go nuts, right? And here we are. Uh, you know, live in life. I think I could call myself, uh, you might call me middle class. I say I'm pretty poor. I always tell my wife I'm pretty poor. I tell my kids I'm pretty poor. And I could say, yeah, I could see getting up early to pray for the kids. But if I were a multimillionaire, would I be doing that? You know, I don't know. You know, like, uh, I think of a guy one time he got very rich and he traveled a lot of places, you know, uh, if you're traveling all the time, would you be doing that? You know, it's just something to think about the context, the fact that Job was was blessed by God, yet he was still humble and fearful of God. What a rare, rare person, rare breed. And God calls him uh, these gives him these wonderful compliments that he that he was perfect before him and that he pleased God. And so think of this. If he pleased God and it's written there in Job one, four through five right? That he did this continually, that it did like past tense, then that must have pleased God. I think I can make that connection that if Job was found to be righteous in God's sight, and this is something that Job had been doing prior to all the stuff happening, that it pleased God that he did it. It pleased God that he was praying on behalf of his kids, that he was giving sacrifices on behalf of his children. That pleased God. We are to be doers of the word. And if we're not, we're deceiving ourselves. And if we are doers of the word, then we're blessed in what we do. I think that's pretty simple. I'd rather be blessed in what I do than deceive myself. Amen. And, and I won't go on a long tangent, but like, you know, people that have big egos and pride and all this stuff, right? It's often said that they'll all stumble. You know, the pride goes before the fall or uh, whatever the, the King James says, something similar. Well, you know what? That's what uh, doer, being a doer of the word, it's being humble right? That's what it is. It's humility, isn't it? It's belief and humility. So how do you value God's word? Are your actions showing that you esteem God's word even more than your food? Again, I've I've shared with you that private detail about my morning routine, not to brag on me, but hopefully it's helpful because again, I view myself just like you. If you're listening, I'm no different than you. I'm I'm a common person. Amen. Uh, I'm nobody special. And if I wake up and do that, my action is showing something. So if your actions told a story, if you were not allowed to write anything other than what you did on a certain day, what story would it tell? Would it tell a story of valuing God's word more than even your necessary food? Dedication and discipline are required to achieve anything great especially in a spiritual battle. If this idea gets a hold of you, if you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to esteem God's word more than my necessary food. I'm going to be in God's word, amen, day in and day out. I'm going to spend time with it. I'm going to value it. You know the devil's going to come with his entire arsenal to distract you, to get you to try to be disobedient, to get you off track. He's going to throw every snare and trap in your way, which means all the more you need to be praying in, in God's word. And I want you to just think of one other thing before we move on to our last point. How do you treat those you value most? 
How do you treat those you value most? You know, I value uh, here on earth, uh, my wife and my kids, probably I have to say the most, I value my family here on earth. So I put God before them because I'm instructed to, and I love the Lord. And they know that, that my first love is God. And they see that in daddy's life, uh, I believe. Uh, But here on earth, I value the kids. I value my wife. And you know what? Because I value them, I spend time with them. uh, I'm present with them. I try to listen to them. I, I, I live sacrificially for them. You know, I'm trying to live out the, what uh, the Bible calls me to live out as a godly father, as a godly husband. You know, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. You know, I'm trying to do all of these things. Amen. Now, if we say, God, we love you, God, we, we, we value you, and we don't esteem his word more than our necessary food, what is that really saying about us? You know, you can get very deep into this. You know, the commandments deal with like uh, gluttony, right? The idea of just like having no discipline and just pigging out all the time. I don't think that makes God happy or laziness, you know? Uh, if you, The Bible says if you uh, don't work, you shouldn't eat, okay? I don't think it make God happy. So if we are to be pleasing to God, we should have that discipline and we should have that mindset that, Lord, we value you. And by valuing you, we value your word more than our necessary food. And because of the things that we value in life, we spend a lot of time with them. We're going to spend a lot of time in your word because we value you, right? Wouldn't that make sense? Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David correctly writes here that the word is powerful, that the word is illuminating, that the word helps us to understand where to go. And so as we value God's word, we're able to articulate that in, 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 our, in our writing, in our words, in our thoughts, in our prayers. We are able to see the fruit of it. So I'm not advising you to esteem God's word higher than your necessary food just for fun. I'm doing it because the Bible tells us we should. I'm, I'm preaching this because I know it is good. It's been good for me. I can testify to that. And I'm preaching it because I know it'd be good for you. Amen. That you, as you esteem God's word that highly, will benefit greatly from that exercise. Finally here, what's getting in the way? And you know, if you're uh, watching this on YouTube, we have a YouTube channel. Just look up KJV Cafe. Uh, I've got an image of a Bible and on one end, a bowl of ramen and on the other end, a cell phone. And the reason why I threw the phone in there, I had to put the phone in there because I feel like maybe you tell me, well, I guess you can't tell me, but you could email me or something. Maybe the phone is getting in the way. You know, what's getting in the way of you spending more time in God's word? What is the distraction? What is the obstacle? You know, you, you may say, well, I don't have a lot of free time, okay? Well, the free time that you do have, what are you doing? You know, um, or you may have a ton of free time and say, I don't know what's going on. Just, just the, I don't know about all phones, but some phones have an actual, what is it called, screen time monitor measure. It'll tell you. The phone can actually spit back some data points telling you how long and how much you spend on it. Amen. And so maybe, just maybe, that phone is getting in the way. Yes, you can have a Bible app. I've got a Bible app. And yes, you can have a daily verse and the phone can be helpful. But generally speaking, it's bzz, 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 ring, ring, bzz, bzz. And now, of course, you got your watch going ding, 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 and the, and the phone going ring, 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 and, you know, whatever else, smart device. You, now they got glasses and stuff, headsets. You got the infotainment in the car. I mean, it's everywhere, smart TVs. Whatever is getting in the way, remove it. You know, and I, I would say social media would be a big one. Just that never-ending scroll. You know, ask yourself questions like, what am I doing when I have free time? And how is that making me feel? And am I any better after spending this time doing this thing? You know, and I've talked before on the program about how I love sports and how I've asked myself lately as I preach messages like this, am I watching too much sports? Am I reading too much sports stories? And, you know, I've personally cut back some too, because I spend more time in God's word, the better. That's what I'm thinking. And it's true. Amen. It's fruitful. It's profitable. And so the phone can get in the way. How about quote unquote friends? You know, maybe you have people that literally are constantly nagging you to go do something and go hang out and go do this or whatever it is. Unbelievers, you know, maybe you have people that are simply just not necessarily getting you away from God's word physically, 
but they are spiritually distancing you. They're influencing you to do sinful things, or they are sowing unbelief in you. Or maybe it's just unbelief on your own, where you just don't really know, hey, is God's word really true? And that right there could be the biggest obstacle. Job, if he's getting up at the crack of dawn, again, as rich as he is and as busy as he was, you have to believe that he believed. You know, I I had a lost relative tell me one time, I don't believe Clark because I was witnessing to him, but I believe you believe. And I said, well, that, okay, I guess that, I guess that's progress. (laughs) But hey, you know what? Job believed, amen. And you need to think about this. You need to say, you know what, Lord, please help me to believe. Give me, Lord, Uh, a conviction to study your word. Ask him, pray, ask God to open his word. Go in, if you don't know where to start, go into uh, the book of John, go into uh, 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 some of the gospels, amen. Go into the book of Corinthians, amen. Go into the book of Romans. Spend some time in God's word and pray and ask God, God, open your word to me. Help me to understand it. You know, and if you're someone that's very detailed, there's a great book that turned into a movie called The Case for Christ. I highly recommend that, that book or the movie. Uh, it's an awesome movie. The guy's a journalist. He's lost. And he's like, I'm going to prove that Jesus didn't really live. And he, as he goes to prove this, right, he studies it. He gets saved. He gets on fire for God. He's in the ministry now. It's a great movie. And it shows that, you know what, if you truly and objectively want to research Jesus Christ, he'll op- he'll, he'll show you. He'll show you. There's other stories I could tell, testimonies that I've heard. Professors that were out in the world. There was a feminist professor. I think she was she was feminist professor. I don't know if she was uh, homosexual or not, but she was feminist. I think she might have been uh, a lesbian or something like this. And she was so hateful of God, and she had made it her goal. She said, I'm a professor. All I do is research. I'm going to research the Bible to the point where I can disprove it. And guess what happened? She got saved, amen. She married a preacher, amen. Uh, She's testifying on Christian radio. Oh, I love it. There's so many stories out there of people that have just said, I will approach the Bible with an intensity, with, with, with a passion, with a fervent nature to understand who God is. And let God do the work. Have that faith. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if you have a faith problem, and as crazy as it sounds, spend more time in the word of God, seeking God and see what he does to your faith. Again, there are times that I just, my jaw drops. I'll read something in the Bible. Maybe there's an archaeological discovery somewhere and I'll just be like, wow, you know, I can't believe it. You know, they found, you know, Hezekiah's, reservoir tunnel or something. Oh, they found the altar over here. You know, uh, uh, they found, um, this thing from, you know, the city of David, a coin with his inscription on it. And it all backs up God's word. And it's a matter of faith. Amen. And just remember in this world, Proverbs 14, 12 gives us some direction. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In this world, there is going to be so many distractions and so many passions that go, that are going to work at you to go away from his word. And you have to make God's word a priority. And if not, then this idea of this way which seems right to man will creep in. And, and the Bible tells us the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seems right to man to do what they want to do. to to pursue a path of what they want to pursue, to esteem what they want to esteem, maybe books made by men, maybe false religions, whatever it is. And that leads to death, spiritual death and literal death. It's not good, amen. The way, the truth, the life is Jesus Christ. His word is a love letter to you, to me, to everyone that will ever open it up. It is a perfect book. It is the book is alive. Amen. The book cuts it and uh, coming and going. It helps convict us. It helps cleanse us and sanctify us. It helps save us. It is the tool that God uses for saving. I don't know about you. If you've been saved, I got saved. I got walked down Romans road. Amen. Ever since then, as I preach about salvation, I'm preaching from God's word. It's not, not my ideas. It's God's word. The book saves us, sanctifies us, gives us hope for the future helps to bind us up, helps us to 
give us sweet, sweet words of encouragement, helps us to understand the character of God, the power of God, the majesty of God, God, what God did in the past, what he's doing in the present, and what he's going to do. That's all in the Bible. One of the first messages I ever preached in a little chapel, literally called Chapel on the Field, was uh, how big is heaven? And you got all the dimensions there in the Bible. And it was so much fun to preach that because here we have the Bible telling us all about where we are going, those that are saved. So we are to esteem his word more than food. And again, this is coming from someone that loves food, but we are to put that word above that even ourselves. How great would that be the day that you see the Lord and you say, Lord, I wasn't perfect. Lord, I fell into all kinds of problems, Lord. I know I'm a sinful creature, Lord, but I esteemed your word more than my necessary food. God, I did that. Oh, what a wonderful way to to greet the Lord for him to know that you had so much faith that you were one of the rare few to do that, just like Job had. Amen. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. Take care. God bless and amen.